out of a lot of the things that I did there, I really, really feel like we we could have we could have got a lot more mileage out of that. You know what I mean? We could have done more. But you know, again, it's it's the the nature of what it is, and it's a professional wrestling, and and you know, you don't always have that call. All right, look at the size of this man. Rob Terry joining us. Thank you so much for taking the time to do this. Listen, thank you so much for having me, my friend. I appreciate it. I can't imagine that too many of your clothes have sleeves when you're this large. Yeah, well, it, it's easier. It's easier to have them cut off or just have no sleeves at all. But yeah, shopping's always been a problem. I tell that to everyone. You do not want to go shopping with me at all. No, it's 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 a misery. Well, I mean, not only are you, you know, large and, you know, very, uh, you have a giant frame, you're also tall. Like that, that yeah. must make it difficult too. It does. Yeah. You know, a lot of the clothes, they, they don't tailor to, you know, like pants, for example. That's the worst for me. You know, you, uh, a lot of them are like slender on the thigh and then I got to order like, I don't know, like three sizes up on the waist and then I got the waist tape, tape it down. So it's just an ongoing nightmare that I've, I've just always had that issue with. So I'm kind of used to it now. Well, so, it's a good yeah. problem to have. I guess you could say that. I'm, I, hey, I'm not going to complain at all. So I just finished watching the new film, Generation Iron, Natty for Life. I, I was blown away by it. And as a wrestling fan, as an Impact wrestling fan, I certainly yeah. learned a lot more about you than I might have seen just watching you in the ring. And, and that's, you know, like I tell everyone, that's a huge thing for me. It's like, and you nailed it. You know what I mean? It's like not too many of the people who, who watch professional wrestling, they, they don't know that much about me at all in terms of my bodybuilding career. So it was such a cool concept for me to really go on record and just tell my story and how it is. And, um, and, you know, just, just some of the struggles that I, I grew up with, you know what I mean? It's, it's really relevant to who I am and it's really such a, a relief for me to put that out there and just let people know who I really am, you know? So How did this project come together? How did you get invited? This is the fourth generation Iron film. I've watched all of them. They're fantastic. Yeah. How yeah, did you get invited to be part of this one? You know, same with me. I mean, you know, I, I, I'm, a, I'm a, a, a huge admirer of all the films. You know what I mean? Obviously, you know, Pumping Iron, the, you know, the, the original, original, should we say, was a huge part of my growing up. And then, you know, as I was in the bodybuilding world and just doing my thing, competing in the natural, um, for the natural Olympia, I think it was around about that time they had Generation, one, uh, Generation Iron come out. And I thought, wow, this is cool. This is like the new modern version of the pump and iron that was back in the day so i needed to check this out you know i knew who all the characters were um even before watching it because i was a huge fan of the bodybuilding scene full stop so um yeah you know it was just a cool thing to see those guys on tv a lot of them i was friends with you know anyway so that was a kind of a cool deal and um yeah you know i i, I loved it and then as i started progressing um, and I turned pro as the two-time natural Mr. Olympia, and I was going in for my third show. Um, the, the organization, the IMBA, PMBA, which is who I compete with, they said, hey, you know, Generation Iron is, is looking for people, and we'd really like to just put your name forward. I think it would be, you know, really good for you and really good for them. So I was like, I'm absolutely, you know, this is, you know, if it works out, it works out. And it would be a great opportunity for me, uh, like I said, to to tell my story and, and and everything else and promote natural bodybuilding the way that I always do. So, um, yeah, they they hit me up and um, I talked to them a little bit. I gave them a little bit of my story. And, and it, it was almost as if they'd already decided even before speaking to me pretty much that they wanted me to be part of this, which was a cool thing as well. And um, then I started just going back and forth with them my family were coming into town you know they they visit like twice a year so i really felt like it was a, a good thing for them to speak on my behalf as well because they had such a massive impact on my upbringing um my morals and everything else you know what i mean and and they also knew the concerns that i had obviously now watching generation i and you know i have one kidney so um when when you're talking about the enhanced realm of bodybuilding whatever people want to think and you know i'm not here to you know change people's opinions or whatever not i don't care i used to i don't anymore but the, the point is that they were a really big driving force for me because they knew um, of the enhanced side and they knew I wouldn't be able to go that route so you know it was just really cool to have them on that and tell my story and everything else and reflect on it it was it was just the 
and even the people that I work with on a day to day, you know what I mean? It was, it was really, really cool. So you mentioned a big detail in there, which I didn't know. I think a lot of people don't know that, that you only have one kidney. So can you explain, yeah. you know, what happened there when you were growing up? Yeah. So, um, I mean, first of all, I'm no physician, don't get me wrong, but, um, when I lived back in the UK, I was, about, I was about, um, maybe it was about seven and a half. It was a good, like six months before I actually had my kidney out, but there was, this wasn't even talked about in the documentary as well. So this is breaking ground right now. But um, I, I was that kid, you know, I was adventurous and uh, mischievous, if you like. And, and my, we were moving, or we had a removal truck. I can't remember exactly what, what it was for, what we were moving and whatnot. I just know I was with my dad. I was stuck to his hip. He went in the house and um, I was like, oh, man, you know, I'll go in the driver's seat and pretend to drive this thing and whatever not. And I flipped the handbrake and the next thing, they started rolling back. We lived on a kind of, it wasn't a hill but it was on a gradient and it just started rolling back. I freaked out and um, I, I opened the door and I jumped out. The door hit me as I jumped out. It sort of came back and hit me. Um, and then the front wheel went over my pelvis. And that was my one of my major first injuries, I guess. I fractured my pelvis, okay? And wow. um, that was pretty much that. I was in hospital for like three days and it was like, okay, great, bye. And, you know, took it easy. Um, and then six months after that, uh, I was getting ready to go for school and I had excruciating pains on my left side. And um, my my mother, again, like I said, I was a mischievous kid. I was trying to get out of school any day I could. And um, basically, you know, she thought that's what I was trying to do. And um, turns out that we went to the hospital and um, they said, look, you're going to you're going to need to have your kidney out. You know, and I was I was eight years old. So that was a pretty big thing for me to try and comprehend. And maybe I didn't understand it like I should. But um, yeah, that, that was a big deal for me. You know, um, I had a kidney out. I did not have a transplant. Um, you know, I got the scar and everything else. But um, yeah, so I had the kidney out. And, uh, and, and that was kind of a, a definitive moment in my life when my family knew, you know, yeah. I could still live, you know, a normal life, and, you know, and everything else, but I just needed to take care of myself. Um, and, and that's something as I grew older that I really sort of appreciated and, and knew that I had to do that. Is there anything now, 32 years later that you can't do, or you have to, you know, you, you can't do as well because you only have one kidney? Um, no, not really. I mean, I don't, I mean, I'm, I'm really, and I don't, I say anti-medication. I don't like taking medications for anything. So, you know, there's, I remember when I was growing up as a kid, you know, people would say, yeah, they got to hook him up to this thing and he's got to do all like, I don't know, all this kind of stuff for the, I, I I don't I live like a, a drug free life to with my with my my kidney so um, you know I just I just try and take care of it I don't drink um, uh, I'm not saying that I've never drunk but like obviously I went to you know when I was around eighteen you know I'd, I'd experiment with drink like most kids do and stuff but it now again as I get older I, I realize you know that first of all I want this fitness lifestyle and number two I've kind of got to protect myself so. Um, People say to me, "Hey, you know, do you drink and, and everything else?" Like, I I don't. You know what I mean? It's it's just something that that helps to protect me. And even though the bodybuilding lifestyle isn't ideal as well, you know what I'm saying? Um, that that's something that I talk about a lot as well. You know, I'm a big dude, so um, being close to 280 is kind of my my regular in the off season. So, um, you know, I my my diet usually looks at about 300 grams of protein a day, which is it's not. It's not that that is a big amount, but it's not massive. Do you know what I'm saying? So I'll never yeah. really need I'll never really need to go over that. So I'm very cognizant not to do so. Um, and plus, it's not like just 300 grams of protein solid. It's obvious mixed up of you know the the how do I say the the, the, the proteins that are in uh, carbohydrates that aren't you know like a complete chain. So whatever I can do to kind of make that up and you know not just have slabs and slabs and slabs of meat to uh to attain that so i just very very cautious and you know um conditioned to to understand what goes in my body and and, you know, and everything else yeah, i mean you're you're very proud to be a natural bodybuilder and <laughs> extremely you talk about it, yeah you talk about in the film how you you probably couldn't do steroids because you only have one kid sure. is yeah. that was that a big factor early on you get into bodybuilding i mean i think a lot of people just go i think that's a thing you have to do yeah, um, absolutely. And, and, you know, I can drive multiple points off that. But if I if I really focus on myself, it's, 
it's it's really a, it's a hard thing to explain but and and you you again you know you, you really driving home my points before I even get them. But like you said, being proud of it, you're you're one thousand percent right, because I remember at fourteen or fifteen years old, I was I had these these weights that I bugged the hell out of my parents, you know, to 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 get me, and I was working out. My mum was watching TV, and she was just watching TV, and I was just working out um, to the side of her, just watching TV as well, just you know, just doing my thing. And she looked over and she double tucked me in as well, and she and I was like, what? What are you looking at? And she was like you're bigger than most guys, you know what I mean? At like that age. And I, I didn't, you know, it was like, oh yeah, that's cool. That's cool. Let's keep going, you know? And it was just kind of that thing. And it's, it's like, I don't know, you know, what to relate it to, uh, like dominoes or anything that you kind of build up something in your life, you know? And it's like, it's just so important to you to, to keep going, to keep building. And then you, to the point where you're like, how much can I build of this? Do you know what I mean? And then, yeah then you look behind you and you're like, man, I built that. And mm. it's like, you know, and then all of a sudden everyone outside of that is like, you didn't build that. You didn't build it naturally. And then you just want to protect, you just want to protect, protect, protect what you've built. And it was just, it was just one of those things, you know, like I, I just had people in the gyms, you know, and, and, and they were cool people, you know what I mean? It's just, they, everyone has their opinion, just like I have my own choice. And, you know, they would be, you know, listen, you're doing really good, man. You're really good, but you're not going to be able to get any bigger than that. Um, you, you're not going to get any, you're not going to be able to get any bigger than that unless you go to this other side. And my mind would, it wouldn't get infuriated, but it would just be like, you watch, I'm going to do it. <laughs> and that's, that was just kind of my attitude the, the entire time. And I just felt like I had so much energy to try and convince people. And that was my entire thing. It was like, all these people will come up to you. There's no way you're natural, dude. It's not possible. And and I would just, I would spend whatever I was doing. If I was on a night out, if I was going somewhere, I would just stop everything. And I would spend one solid hour. And I remember being so drained and depleted um, physically and mentally because I'm constantly exhausting everything that I've done to try and achieve what I do on the level that I do it on. And, you know, they would walk away and they would be like, Okay. But then, you know, I'm like, did I really, did I do it? It would, it would, it would drive me nuts. You know what I mean? But I have a totally different mindset today. Um, like I said, I, I can, there's not, there's really no words that I can kind of tell you how important it is for me to get my story out there. It's kind of like a legacy that I have, but, um, you know, and it, it's one that I'll defend as well. You know what I mean? It's, it's like, it's not like, okay, I, I will undergo any kind of test and that possibly is, um, to defend that because it is true. And it's just, it's just a great feeling, you know what I mean? So, yeah, you know, but you're absolutely right. People do generally think that, yeah, if you want to do that, then you have to kind of do this. And I respect that. And like I said, it's a choice. And people want to do things different ways. But just being an ambassador for natural bodybuilding, and if I can convince, not convince is the wrong word, but if I can just show people that there is a chance that you or an option for you that that's different to that because not everyone can do that you know what i mean or maybe certain people wouldn't want to do that but by people watching this movie on generation i and natty for life if i can inspire people to think okay well i want to do this as well if he can do it i can do it because mm -hmm. there's nothing really that separates yeah i've got great genetics i'm not gonna lie but i mean you know what i mean anyone can do this you know what i'm saying and if i can just show people that then that's a huge huge victory for me to clarify this for people who are watching or listening what exactly does natural mean when you I, lo I love thank you <laughs> you dude you're killing all the questions today man i really loving this because no one's really asked me that you know what i'm saying and um you, you know so um because everyone, especially on Generation I, everyone's asking the questions on steroids, right? Let's, you yeah. know, that, that's what it is. But to me, it's it's so much more than that. It's it's any agent that you could possibly put into your body to to make it um, in, enhanced in any type of way. So, you know, you're talking growth hormones, um, insulins, steroids, and uh, diuretics, anything like that. If there's anything like th that's probably the the, the span of radio range that I'm thinking. But if there's anything else as well, that would fall into it. Now, if we're talking a, a cup of coffee from Starbucks, then I totally <laughs> fail because I, I am a caffeine <laughs> addict. So you know what I'm saying. So that that's 
that's I, I mean ca caffeine is a drug do you know what I'm saying but you know what I mean I, oh, I'm I, a big I, I'm a big pre-workout guy I get this <laughs> <laughs> yeah you know ca caffeine I'm a really big caffeine guy you know I, I love my coffee so but anything outside the realm of coffee that's as pretty much as hardcore as I, I would go you know what I mean is is a cup of coffee um it sounds ridiculous and retarded but that's just what it is that's just that's just my it's the standard that I set for myself um and it's the standard that's that's that remains the same and the constant since I was ever existed. So, so where does TRT fall into the regulations? I I don't know. Um, okay. I I don't know about that. I'm not sure. Um, I was just asking out of curiosity because I think that, there's a lot, and that's a, that's a really valid question as well. And we've seen this in a lot of other sports. Uh -huh. uh, where, like UFC is a great example where guys will do TRT because it's doctor prescribed. Right. Yeah. No, I, I honestly, that is a great question. Maybe that would be a great, great question for um, either someone in the testing realm or the organization itself. Uh, because again, that that's something that to this day I've not ever needed to do. So um, it's not something that I've ever looked into. So how are but, you able to? How are you able to balance the lifestyle of being a bodybuilder while also being a wrestler? Because you know we know that you're on the road all the time. Tough to get meals. Tough to get a good night's sure. sleep. How it are you is. Able to balance that? Yeah, you know, um, I'll, if you don't mind, I'll, I'll backtrack. But work, e work, work ethic wise, I mean, even before any of this started, you know, when I was like 20, 22, 23, 24. Um, that was when I was living back home in the UK and, you know, I, I used to work in a bank in the day from like nine till five. Then I, I would go train some people in the gym. Then I train myself and then I jump to a club and do security. And I was doing that five to six nights a week. Right. So just to sort of, you know, you're talking about balance for me, that was probably like one of the, the most demanding times, you know what I'm saying? To do all that. Um, just because a regiment of, of the job that I was working and just had to be in certain places. So that was tough. So I was kind of used to that from a very early age, but with professional wrestling, when I moved into that, um, it is, it is tough. And I think the hardest thing about that was the travel, because what I found is if you, if you don't prepare your own stuff and take it with you, then when you're stuck in an airport, I dare you, I even <laughs> challenge you to eat healthy in an airport. It ain't going to happen, right? No. It ain't going to happen. And you can try, you can do whatever, you know, you can have a salad and a thing, but that, that ain't going to sustain what I would need. So the key for me was really the preparation. And even though, you know, yeah, we were traveling a lot, we were doing a lot of shows. We did have a, you know, I did have a lot of downtime where I was at home and I had that time to prepare the stuff to take with me. You know, there's, there's really no excuse for that. And I think that's something that the bodybuilding taught me straight off the bat is that, you know, and I, I say this a lot as well. And it's something that I really like to reinforce is that, you know, bodybuilding to me is the ultimate discipline, right? Because when, when you're training, you, you, as, as a pro mindset, you are in total command of what you do physically and mentally, okay? And then like a lot of sports or disciplines like martial arts, you do get downtime where you, you train your ass off. And, you know, I'm not saying that a bodybuilder trains harder than anyone else, but when you are training like three, four, five hours on a football field and stuff like that, you get time to relax, to chill. As a pro bodybuilder, that time never clicks off because even though you step outside the gym now yeah. you now you put on a different hat and now it's like nutrition what can i do to fuel everything so it's that mindset of bodybuilding that really transcended and taught me how to apply myself um into different fields so when i knew i had that downtime I had to be productive doing a lot of other stuff, but mainly it was like, okay, well, now's my time to prepare my food so I don't get screwed when I go to the airport. You know what I'm saying? So that's kind of how it regulated and how I use that to my advantage. When, you, when you're going through security with like- Oh my God. Oh my God, dude. Dude, <laughs> I, I wish I, I would look at the person behind me and say, hey, how much do you want to bet they're going to stop me here? You know what I mean? And and on top of that, I had, fa you know, when I was doing wrestling shows, I had all this like fake, I'm Welsh, right? So a tan for me, is not really going to happen. This light, I don't know what I look like on your camera, but I, it's just probably good lighting if I look tanned. I'm white <laughs> as hell. So, um, yeah, you know, I'd, I'd wear fake tan going through the security, and I don't know what it was, but, like, you know when they have those swabs and they, they uh, yeah. I don't know, whatever, yeah, they, like they touch your hands? And stuff. They were, it, 
Yes, there they were agents in the explosive. Uh, there were agents in that tent that would come up with the explosives part. So that they would just take me into the next room and then the next room. I was like, I'm going to miss my flight. I am not going to get to my destination. <laughs> so I learned pretty fast to apply the tan when I get there versus before I go. So, yeah, no, they, they would go through all my powders, you know, the protein powders, you know, you, my, my, my creatine and glutamine powders, which obviously look like a recreational drug. You know what I mean? So. Sure. It was uh, it was crazy. Yeah, I'd always have a fun time going through the airport. But they'd look at me and you know they'd see that I was a big guy and a bodybuilder, and they just you know they 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 for the most part they knew when they understood. How did you get discovered? How did you get that break in wrestling? Yeah. So um, again, you know, going back, uh, my my physical transformation started at thirteen. I was a young kid wow. and wouldn't wouldn't recommend that to too many people. But um, I, I was lucky and I got away with it. But my mental transformation started so much earlier. You know what I'm saying? I was, I was like 10, maybe 8 to 10. Um, and around that time, at 10 years old, you know what I mean? And me and my, my friends and I, we'd, uh, we'd watch all these movies, movies that were like for way older people, like 18, 18 plus and all that kind of stuff. And obviously, they're all Arnold movies. They're all Sylvester Stallone movies. And they're, you know, everything like that and then i'm watching like the the wwf i'm getting introduced into that um like british gladiators was on you know um when i was younger than that i, I kind of you know playing with like um uh he-man toys all these things in my life right the everything single thing about it had one thing in common everyone was jacked <laughs> okay in the 80s when i was born it was just there were so many influences you know and um Every, everyone was was in shape and it just really molded my mind uh, from a young age and it captivated me that, that that's how I want to look. So how did you get discovered? How did, how did the wrestling thing happen for you? So that, you know, obviously everything kept going forward. I started working out at 13. I started training. I did my first competition when I was 18, bodybuilding show. Um, and then I... Like I said, being a huge wrestling fan, I watched it and I would just, I would like, man, I'd love to do that. You know what I'm saying? But I just have no idea how to get into it. And um, short story, we got for the first time when I was 22, got to see a wrestling show and it was a live event in London. And uh, I had, I had tickets and I had the seats right next to the ring. Okay. And I thought, man, these seats are bad. I can't, I'm not going to be able to see the match. I want to be right next to the ring. They ended up being the best seats in the house, right? Because Sure. All the wrestlers were right next to me walking down the ramp. So I was just sizing these guys up. I was like, Triple H, pff, I'm bigger than this dude. You know, all these guys, I was like, man, I'm, 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 way, I'm way bigger than these guys. This is, I can do this. This is, this is for me. This is what I'm going to do. And a, lot, a few of these guys would come up to me. I think it was the big show. Um, Razor Ramon, Scott Hall, he came up to me. These guys were getting in my face because they, they were like, look at this kid over here, the Jack guy. I lost my mind, right? I had my top off. I was flexing at these guys. And um, the show ended and, you know, I remember driving back home. It was like a three and a half, four hour drive. And it was the, the most depressing time of my life because I realized at that point that this was something that I wanted to do so bad and I just had no idea how to get into it. Mm. And um, it was, you know, like, it was like a fire got lit under my butt and I would send these tapes off to America. I dressed up as a gladiator. I, I got these. I, I <laughs> I didn't even hire them. I talked these guys into filming me and doing a movie and all this kind of stuff to, to sort of apply to try and get hired and all that kind of stuff. But, you know, all these attempts that I was actively making, just it was almost like nothing was working, okay? So, I again, you know, I was still into natural my, my natural bodybuilding and trying to turn pro as a natural pro. So in 2006, um, my my wife and, and I, we uh, we went out to Hollywood, California, and I did my show and I was in before the show, I was in a weigh in segment and um, this lady came and sat down to me, sat down next to me. And she was like, hey, I'm from the WWE. Um, we, we're looking scouting talent. We think you, you got a great luck and we'd love to discuss and explore the opportunity of signing you as a WWE wrestler. My jaw hit the floor and did not come back up. It, it was just <laughs> it was the craziest moment in my life. And um you know, again, I, I attribute everything to that for natural bodybuilding. You know, it was just the right place, right time. 
Yeah. And um, that was in 2006. And then the, the, the end of 2000, 2007, I was living in Florida. And, uh, you know, I was actually meeting and training with these guys that I was just a huge fan and admirer of, you know, all most of my life. So it was a pretty wow. cool and surreal experience for me. So you're going down this path, trying to make this thing happen for yourself and really not getting anywhere. And right. Just like that, the right person changes everything for you. Yeah. Yeah. It was, it was insane. It really was. So you're in Florida crazy. and you start training at FCW, which is WWE's developmental at the time. This is before NXT, right? Yes. Yeah. This was their original. So yeah, it was the, uh, the FCW, um, before, and before the one Vince now. must be looking at you going, this guy's, this guy's a future champion. You're, I mean, you're exactly what Vince McMahon wants. Yeah. Well, you know, it, it, it was, it was really, he was actually the first guy I met when I was doing my tryouts. Wow. And I just, I just remember I was sweating profusely. Um, my wife looked over and she's like, what's wrong with you? And I'm like, that's Vince McMahon. So yeah, it, it was a pretty cool thing. You know, I got to meet him and, um, you know, he, he's a very intense individual, great guy. And, uh, it, it was super cool. I mean, I think people know you from your time in TNA, of course, but you know, you did spend some time in, in WWE and Chris Jericho wrote in his biography that he wanted to make you his protege. What, what ended up happening with that? I, I don't know. I, I, I don't know about that. Um, multiple times people will tell me that that would have been the coolest thing for me. Um, that would have been freaking awesome. But you know, it's, it's the wrestling world, you know, people have ideas, they go so far and then sometimes they don't materialize. It's just the nature of, of the industry. So, but that, that would have been a cool concept. I would have, I would have loved that. It would have been a great opportunity and, and you know, yeah. So how did the good. transition go from WWE then to TNA? So, yeah. So I was with WWE, um, I think it was like a year and a half, you know, and, uh, it was, it was just one of those things. Um, I don't know, man. I thought I was doing so good. Um, I remember there, there was one instance when uh, my wife and I, my wife and I, I was on a visa with them and uh, my wife was staying here on a visa. Uh, and we just thought, okay, let's, let's go, go back home. We'll get, we'll get married. Cause we planned that all along. And then um, we, you know, I cleared it with the office and everything else like that. And I came back and it was just a weird thing. I was there for two weeks. And then, you know, they, they called me and they're like, Hey, sorry, man, we, you know, we, we, we got to cut you. And I'm like, man, you kidding me. You know what I mean? So that was, that was like, a, that was a really, really hard time for me. Because, because you I went thought, away. Is that why? You know, that, that's the thing with, with the WWE and especially when you're in the develop, you'll never really know the actual reason there are. I mean, I personally have a, a few of the, you know, conspiracy conspiracies, what, what happened, but I mean, you're never really going to know the true real reason. They're never going to say it to you. Do you know what I mean? Um, but yeah, that, that was a really hard time for me, man, because I really, you know, I really loved what I was doing. I was super new. You know what I mean? I, I had so much more to learn um, and everything else, but yeah, that was, that was, that was, that was a bum time for me. You know what I mean? Because I, I really didn't see it coming. No one really did. Yeah. Um, but, you know, then again, my, my wife, Sarah, she said, hey, you want to do this, right? And I was like, yeah, absolutely. She's like, okay, um, let's go up to Orlando. So we went up to Orlando and uh, we went to see Devon, um, Bubba Ray and Devon Dudley. Yeah. And they have the Team 3D Academy in Kissimmee, Florida. And, um, yeah, I started training there. And, you know, I bust my ass. I had to do that. I, I bust my ass every single day because the type of people they are, they want you to prove it to them that you want it. You know what I mean? And that's, that's pretty much what I did. I drove up there like three to four times a week and um, I trained. And um, a cool thing with that is that, you know, B Bubba Ray Dudley, he, I mean, I don't know if you know who he is. He's a yeah, very, you know, straight, he's, he's just a very, very straight up guy. You know what I mean? He's like, hey. You know, we talked and, you know, I told him my story about being natural and everything else. And, he, you know, he's like, okay, you he said, you, you won't let me down. Right. And I was like, sir, I would never, ever let you down. He's like, I didn't think so. So it was almost like, I mean, he didn't have to go to bat, go to bat for me because at that time they had wellness policy in the WWE and so was impact wrestling. Professional wrestling as a whole was under a microscope for yeah. situations that happened prior in 2006, where, you know, we had Eddie Guerrero. Um, and then uh, the Chris Benoit incident, oh, yeah. where, where basically, I mean, you know, whatever happened, happened, but 
everything media wise was pinpointed on steroids <clears throat> and performance enhancing drugs. So it was really important for Bubba Ray to really, um, you know, have his trust in me. And then he went to TNA and said, Hey, look, I got this guy. You're probably not going to believe it, but he's, he's a freak. And, and that's pretty much where that came in. Um, little did I know until after that, but, but you know, he, he really, you know, went to bat for me and, um, he told them, you know, everything about me. And, and that, that point was history. I was part of the British invasion. So, yeah. So w while you're doing wrestling, that now becomes the dream. You know, the dream went mm -hmm. from bodybuilding to now being pro wrestling. Yeah. Did you ever think that you'd be getting back into the pro side of bodybuilding when you're, you know, in the meat of this, when you're, when you're in the heart of your wrestling career? Um, yes, I, I, I always, I have such a pa passion for bodybuilding. I mean, I'm always going to be a bodybuilder like forever, you know what I mean? My lifestyle and everything else. Uh, even though I say it's not a lifestyle, it's just, it's just a way of, of, of living if you like. But, um, the, the, maybe not the competitive aspect of it, but I just love the challenge, you know? So as soon as I came out of the, the contracts, even with TNA, when, when we mutually decided, okay, you know, let's, let's both go our separate ways with that. And I had a lot of downtime. It was like, you know, I, I need my next challenge. You know what I mean? And, uh, I, just being aware of the natural Olympia and the title and everything about the organization, about them being, the best tested natural organization out there just appealed to me so much. It was just, it was just a natural progression at some point for me to want to do it. So I, I'm extremely glad I did. And, you know, I'm extremely part of be, I'm extremely happy to be part of the family. I think one of the big takeaways for me from generation iron natty for life, just bodybuilding in general is in most other sports, you're done when you start to hit your thirties. Right. In bodybuilding, you hit your prime in your late thirties. Why, why is that? Well, I think that natural bodybuilding, like I was talking about this the other day, it just, it just gives you such a longevity. You know what I mean? You, you're able to do it for such a long time. And it, it's not like I want to, uh, I will say, you know, there are quite a few and maybe enhanced athletes that I've been a fan of back in the days, you know, where you'll see them in the media and, and doing their thing. It's like, wow, this is awesome. It's like, where do they go? What do they do? You know what I mean? And then maybe you'll see a picture and it's like, oh man, Ugh. you know, natural bodybuilding, you know, you go to a, you go to the natural Olympia this year and you'll see guys there competing in, in my division in their fifties. Okay. Wow. Because that's what I'm saying. It's that longevity that, that natural bodybuilding has. It's a consistency. Um, and I love everything about that. You know what I mean? I have such a passion for this thing. I have such a passion for fitness and everything else. that I just want to do this for as long as I can. Will I be able to do it to the capacity I'm doing it now? I don't know. I would like to. But ultimately, it just has that, you know, where you can just do it way longer than anything else. Is, is, is there like a science behind, you know, does a 39 year old have different maturity to their muscles than a 29 year old would? Yeah. And I, I did a post on Instagram and, um, you know, that was another thing, you know, I had all these, there's another natural guy who was in the professional wrestling world. His name's Jesse Goddard, right? He, yes. He's very, very much a good friend of mine, uh, big brother and everything else. He was on that show. Um, he said, Hey man, why don't you post these pictures? Cause I didn't even think of doing it. I did that. And, um, I'm really glad I did, you know, cause I was reminiscing all over the photo of my, me and my youth when I was like 20, 24 and all that kind of stuff. And it was, I, I looked, you know, I was big back then, but the muscle bellies and everything else are different now that I'm, I'm 40 now. Okay. So it's almost like the muscle is maturing. So, you know, it's almost like you've got more lines, uh, it looks more, more grainy tissue. So the body's changing as you get older. Um, and that, that's, that's kind of cool to look at, you know what I mean? And, and, and see that. So it's just, you, you still have that shape, but it does change. So, um, it, it's kind of cool. You know what I mean? I know that retirements in wrestling are never like a real thing, but are you, yeah. <laughs> are yeah. you, would you call yourself retired from wrestling? Um, not really. I mean, I, for me to go back to one of these major organizations, I would definitely do it because I have such a huge passion for, for wrestling. 
nothing's really changed with that. The only thing that has changed for me now is that, that I have a family. Mm. So, um, it would need to be worth it if you understand. So I, I'm really, I love what I'm doing. I'm really enjoying everything that's going on, but, um, it, it would just need to be worth it. But I, I would, I would definitely do it because I, I, I love the industry. I really do. Well, it's not like you need the job. I mean, you work as a firefighter, um, which was, which was cool to see in the film and, and in your locker at the firehouse is a John Cena belt. Yes. Yeah. So, <laughs> So that that was a, that was a crazy funny day for me. Um, so with with the department that I work at, um, you get assigned to a station, okay? And you know, I I love my station, I love my crew, and everything else about that. But my first day that I got assigned to that station, they um, they had this guy, and he's like six foot eight. He's a big dude, and he had like a Punisher mask on, and he had a belt with that belt. And they played entrance music. And it was kind of like, hey, Rob, welcome to the station. It was kind of like a big introduction. Um, I'll never forget it. it. I was just laughing. I almost fell off the chair. So they, they, they don't do that for everyone. But um, they, they kind of wanted to make it a sort of wrestling spectacle um, when, I, when I first started my first day at the station. So that belt proudly stands, um, you know, on, on that locker um, at the station. So, yeah, that, that's kind of the, the story behind that. Rob, this is quite the journey. Pro bodybuilding to pro wrestling, now to being a firefighter. Yeah, and you know, the firefighting thing, that that kind of I touched on that when when I was in my sort of mid twenties. That there were guys in the gym back home in Wales and they, they were firefighters, you know, and, and um the system there is a lot different than what it is here. But I was like, man, this is a pretty cool thing. I, I'd like to get into this. But again, at that age, I had so many unrealistic things in my mind that that I just wanted, and I didn't know how to achieve them. But I kind of did eventually. So I did. I didn't kind of put my all into getting into that. But again, like I said, when when we came out of contracts with with TNA, and I had this this time to just reflect on where I was going, what I wanted to do. Um, obviously, the the bodybuilding came to mind, and I wanted to get, you know, that I wanted to achieve that title as natural Mr. Olympia. But also I saw this guy in a gym, right? And it was a gym not too far from here. And there was this guy, he was on a treadmill and he was going for it. This guy was dressed out in his bunker gear. He had a face mask on. He had the, the air cylinder on his back and he was breathing off it. Okay. And everyone a lot of these people were looking at this guy like he was a two-headed dragon okay they were like what is this guy doing and um, i looked at him i thought this is the coolest thing in the world so i went over to this guy and i bugged the hell out of him i was like hey man my name's rob tell me everything you know about getting into the fire service and everything else because i figured hey this is my time to do it so i put myself through the schooling and everything else which you know it's it's demanding just that um, and I was fortunate enough to 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 land a job with uh, the city of St. Pete. So that's where I am now. And, you know, it's it's another cool concept is, is the fact that, you know, I got to play or get to play a character on TV and everything else where I'm this badass. And, you know, I I, you know, inspire people and all that kind of stuff. But now I'm not so much going to talk about myself, but really the people that I work with, because what they're willing to do to make someone else's day, which is already the worst day in their life, but a better day is yeah. it's amazing. You know what I mean? And for me to be part of that is, is just so uplifting in my life that, um, you, you know, I love it. I love the job and everything else and everything that goes with it. And it's also one of the things that it's really close to professional wrestling as well in the sense that when we're in the day room, all chilling out, hanging out, it's like being in a locker room. But then when a bell goes off, it's like walking through the curtain. So for me, it's, it's really such a natural habitat, and I love it. I absolutely love it. I, I'm an adrenaline junkie, and you get quite a bit of an adrenaline doing that job. So it's pretty cool. How often do you go to a call and people are like, hey, Rob Perry from TNA? So yeah, no, that it, 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 you know, um, my colleagues will probably be better at telling the stories than I will, but we've been to a few calls, you know, and and I'll walk into a room and I'll be like, man, there's a lot of, there's a lot of John Cena posters around here. You know what I mean? And I'm like, oh God. <laughs> and then the next thing they go, hey, 
you look like someone. I'm like, I do. And then they say, hey, you're that guy, Rob Terry, right? I'm like, yeah, man. And, you know, it, it just goes from there. So it, it does happen, you know, but it, it always makes me smile and just makes me happy. And, you know, just, you know, if you can elevate someone at that point that, you know, you got called to the house and they need your help, then that's a good thing. So. So what exactly happened in your time in TNA? Yeah, I, things seem, I mean, from the outside looking in, seemed to be going fairly well. I wouldn't have expected yeah. you to want to leave. Yeah. Um, man, you know, it was, it was, it was a crazy ride for me. It was amazing. You know, I, I absolutely, I, I loved my, my time with, with a lot of the things, you know, the British invasion was, was awesome. You know, um, uh, that was a really cool time. Then, um, uh, then we did the Robbie E thing and uh, you know, he's, he's a very good brother of mine. Um, when we, when they first told me that we were going to do all that, I was like, I'm not too sure where I fit into this because I'm not like this guy, you know, not like Robbie E because he had a, he had his character down, but it, it turned out to be one of the coolest things, man, because we had such a chemistry. I knew my role and, and obviously he knew his role. Um, and we would just bounce a lot of ideas off each other, man. It just works so well. And, you know, pe people give me a lot of flack these days. They're like, man, you've lost your accent. You've done this. Well, that, I, I accredit that a lot of that to him because he would say bro in every other sentence. And then I go home and I call my wife bro. You know? <laughs> so oh, no. I, was, I was like, dude, you've got to stop saying bro because I'm calling everyone bro, even my wife. But no, no, he's, he's, a, he's a really funny guy, man. And we had such a great run. Um, out of a lot of the things that I did there, I really, really feel like we, we could have, we could have got a lot more mileage out of that. You know what I mean? We could have done more, but you know, again, it's, it's the, the nature of what it is and it's a professional wrestling and, and, you know, you don't always have that call. So, um, it is what it is, you know, got to, got to do a lot of, um, cool stuff with, with team immortal, which is, you know, Hulk Hogan and, and even with Ric Flair, uh, you know, guys that, that, you know, again, coming full circle, I used to idolize back in the day. And, um, you know, then I get the chance to work with these guys. So it, it, it was a really cool, cool thing for me and to be part of that. Um, got to do a bunch of stuff in between that. And then it came to the menagerie. So uh, that, in a nutshell, really, um, it was very different for me because, you know, when we were kind of going into that, I... Um, I was in Japan at that time, you know, I was doing a lot of work in Japan and I was doing really well. I was well recepted over there, um, working with, with a lot of their, their major stars. So for me, I was ready at that point to come back and just do a lot of damage. Okay. I was, I was, I was gearing up for that. And, um, you know, then again, like, like I said, you, you really have no control over a lot of things. You came back and then they were like, hey, we're going to start this new thing. And it's the menagerie. And that was, you know, that was a, a bit of a letdown for me. It was a bit of a disappointment um, because I, I was expecting something else. And, you know, I was still ready to run with everything that they were given. But I felt that what I had was so limited. OK. And even when they presented, OK, this is the idea that I had. Number one, I'm a huge like horror movie fan. Okay. I love horror movies and everything else. So when they said, or oh, gave me the idea about this guy with a mask and, you know, was menacing and all this kind of stuff. I, I love that. Okay. So I, I have a few friends in the movie business and everything else. And, um, the first thing I did, I hit this guy up who's an awesome guy and he made me this mask right? who designed this mask and this thing, I would have been like the next boogeyman or whatever not on tv i don't know man but it, it was so so menacing and i present i presented this to them and they were like ah this is this is too scary and i'm like ah come on you know this is this is what i want you know and they they, they wanted something that was a little watered down so anyway um we we formed the menagerie and and you know it was a a really good stable full of people you know a lot of talent and everything else but yeah. again, it's just one of those things we didn't have the opportunity. And that was around the time when, you know, um, it came up for the co contract, contract negotiations. And I really just wasn't loving what I was doing with the character. And I didn't have the ability to excel. Um, and it was just that point where, you know, it, it just really wasn't worth 
staying there and just hanging around. I just, I'd rather just try and do my own thing, you know, and that, that's kind of where we parted ways on a mutual ground, you know what I mean? And not to say that I'll never go back either, you know, because again, I absolutely love my time. It's just, um, with that character, just, you know, I just got a little burnt out because there, there was just no, no, um, no room to excel. Did you look into maybe talking to WWE again, going back there? Um, yeah, you know, I, I got hit up, uh, again, th th there was, there was rumor and a buzz that, that I was going to go back, back with them. Um, and you know, they, they were going to, they were going to contact me, but, but they, they, they didn't at that time. But I mean, again, I'm, I'm totally open. You know what I mean? I feel, I feel more ready today than I, than I ever was. You know what I mean? Um, so it, it would always be an option for me. So yeah, we'll, we'll, like I said, we'll see. So. Why do you think it is that natural bodybuilding doesn't get the spotlight that something like IFBB gets? Um, I think the reason for that is, number one, there's just so much money, sponsorships, um, you know, e even like pay-per-view deals and, and everything else that goes into that, really. On top of that, you know, other than the, the money that's really pumped into that through all these sort of sponsorships and everything else, um, I think it's that, you know, people generally really, really want to see freaks, you know what I mean? And I think, the, the, you know, in the enhanced side of bodybuilding, th there are, I mean, pretty much all of them are freaks. You know, when, when you look at natural bodybuilding, um, you know, these guys are in crazy and insane condition, but obviously they, they don't have the, the sheer mass that that may be the enhanced side so i think it's just you know that that's really to me is the the one of the main reasons should i say at least but i think ultimately you know it's it's just the money the marketing and everything else that gets put into to the other side you know and it would be really cool to to really with everything that's going on in this natural the movement of natural bodybuilding for some you know recognition and and all that assets is going into the enhanced side to go into to the natural bodybuilding side and really sort of elevate that that would be so awesome to do um but you know again we'll we'll see what happens after that and what what moves are made and everything else you seem to have such a positive attitude i appreciate this so you, much. You, you 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 got to man you know what i say you got to be positive i mean we just had the corona and everything's been shut down and everything else so i mean it's just it's just a cool you know anything could happen at any time my man you got to be positive all the time so you got to at least try so well what does a bodybuilder do when gyms are closed for three months stresses panics goes out of his mind now um I'm, you know, I, I was really lucky, you know what I'm saying? So again, you know, one of the perks of working as a firefighter is that uh, in, in the fire service, fitness is a big deal. So it was, mm. I think it was about most of the stations, you know, I want to say as long as I've been there, they've all had like dumbbells and stuff, whatever not. But um, it's really been in the last two years that they all got refitted uh, for these kind of multi gyms. So, you know, it, that was a really cool thing when, when this whole COVID thing hit and, uh, you know, I was able to work out at the station um, and then on my off going day as well. So that was kind of my saving grace with, with the whole um, COVID situation and just trying to do the best that I could, because I got to be honest, you know, I did, I did look at a lot of these, these videos with like pushups and, and doing pull-ups with these towels and sheets and all this kind of stuff. But, you know, it was just a little hard for me to get motivated to do that. So uh, yeah, I was thankful that I, ha I still had access to the iron that was running through my veins. So that was, that was kind of cool. So what's your workout split look like right now? <clears throat> my workout split, um, it change it changes, but for the most part, it would be. Um, I don't have a specific like on a Monday. I do this. I'm also cycle uh, chest. I would do on my first day with the, with core. Then I would do back. I'm really big on doing the opposite. So if I do chest one day, I have to do a, the opposite, which is you know going to be a back. Um, mm. Then I would do legs uh, to give that a break, my upper body, and then I would go into a shoulder routine. Uh, maybe I'd hit something else with that, either calves or, or core. Um, and then I would do, uh, next day would be um, an arm day. Then after that, I would usually do another leg and another back day on top of that. And what I would do with those days is on my first back day, let's say I started off with doing a lot of pull-ups or pull-downs. My second back day, I would start off doing rows. So it would kind of be a reverse back day, if you know what I mean. Um, and then the same as legs. 
it, my first leg day would probably be quad dominant. So there'd be a lot of squats, a lot of leg extensions and leg presses. And then I do hamstrings towards the end. Um, even though I'm giving the, the second part of like hamstrings a lot of attention, it's really hard for you to give that kind of focus that you would on the first muscle, like the quadriceps. So on my second back day and second leg day, I'll flip flop that and I'll put all the attention on the hamstrings or the, the whatever movement I didn't do first with the back day. So I'm really big on that. So uh, that's, that's kind of what I do. And I just keep cycling that. I, people ask me, you know, how many times a day do I train? Uh, how many days a week? And it's, I train every day. Um, is it something I'd recommend for everyone? Absolutely not. I've been training for 27 years now. So it's just something that I've built up that resistance to. And yeah. I think at, at an early age, you know, I remember reading and people telling me, hey, you know, Arnold trains for like six six hours a day. And that was kind of instilled in my, I don't know whether he did or not, but in a reality, but, um, you know, that, that was something that I thought as a kid, you know, I just have to be in here. I have to put the time in, you know what I mean? I have to train and do all this every day. And I didn't, I didn't train seven days a week when I first started, but it's something that I've gradually built up to and my body is sort of climatized to that. But for me, the most important thing is that I back it up with nutrition as well. You know what I'm saying? So, um, when, when you're doing that kind of training, it does tax your body and you do need to back that up with nutrition to, uh, to definitely, uh, get that recovery process going on as well. <clears throat> not everyone wants to look like you. I'd like to look like you, but not everybody wants to look sure. like this. But, but I think everyone wants to improve and look better and be healthier. Yeah. So what would you say to someone who needs to take those first few steps? <clears throat> so that, if I can talk about you, another, you, you're crushing all these points, but when, when, you know, mindset. Okay. If we talk about mindset and I could, I could talk to you for a good 12 hours on mindset. Cause it's such a big thing. People, yeah. people get occupied so much about what movements do I need to do? What do I need to eat and everything else <clears throat> that there is importance in that it, it's valid, but more so than that is a mindset. Okay. And it's, it's an iron mindset that you have to adapt and, and really live. So when people say, and I get that a lot. Someone will come up to me and they'll say like, hey man, you look like you're in great shape. You know, I want to put, um, you know, like 10 or 15 pounds on, um, but I don't want to look like you. I don't want to get too big. And the second someone says that word, I don't want to get too big. Okay. Number one, if you're enhanced, if you're natural, whatever, whatever you are, there is no way you're probably even going to get too big. Okay. And it's, it's like me saying to someone, hey, how rich do you want to be? Well, I want to be rich, but I don't want to be too rich. You know what I mean? It's like, number one, you, you, you're lying to me, okay? I So the point that I'm trying to make is that whatever you do in life, and that's why bodybuilding really transcends to everything we do in life, is that when you're doing something, in this case, you asked me about training or someone wanted to put on a little bit of weight, their mindset, right? They They, they better look at me and think, okay, I want to put 10 to 15 pounds on. But I'm looking at this guy in front of me and he looks like a monster. So I want to envision myself looking twice as big as he does. You know what I'm saying? It's a mindset. So when I was training or when I do train every single day, when I'm trying to train for the natural Olympia or just be in the best shape I can be, I don't look in the mirror and say, yeah, I want to look a little bit better than what I look. I look in my mind and I try and find a picture of the most craziest Jack guy that I can think of. And for the most part, I'm looking at a picture of Ronnie Coleman in my mind, right? Because to me, to me personally, and there's a lot of opinions th that guy, right. And, and I've met him and everything else, but I'm just saying in bodybuilding generally of an evolutionary guy, he is it right to have that kind of mass and everything else and his back and all this crazy stuff. So when I'm training, I'm looking at a picture of him, Okay, what, am I ever going to get to his standard? Probably not. And I don't even like saying that because that is a negative. But the point is that what my mindset is looking at something way bigger and better than what I am, right? Yeah. And I think for you to move three inches forward, you've got to look a mile ahead, right? That's just kind of the way it is. And mm. the mindset is the most powerful thing that we all possess. So, if someone's looking to do that, then it's just a mindset switch on. The person that says, I want to be big, but I don't want to get too big, they've already failed. 
Do you know what I'm saying? So really, yep. really, it's a mindset deal on everything we do. And you can apply that to money, to sports cars, to anything you want. And it's, it's, it's really relevant to bodybuilding. And I think for me, you know, a lot of the time I'll be like, okay, I'm doing a contest. I want to get shredded. Okay. My mindset is obsessed with me looking shredded and I'll see pictures. I'll see, you know, my mind will just be full of this stuff. And it, it's so crazy because obviously I know what I'm doing, but it's, it, I subconsciously make the right decisions or small decisions or steps that will get me to that decision. Uh, it will get me to that, uh, that goal that I want to do. And it's the same thing with when I'm gaining weight as well. It's, I have this vision of like, okay, I want to get to 280 pounds. You know what I mean? And, and I think about it and I have these visions and everything else. And then subconsciously you just make those grounds. You know, it, it just, it just materializes, it just happens. You know what I'm saying? Obviously you're doing the work to do it, but your mind is manifested by these ideas of getting to where you want to go. So train your mind. You know what I'm saying? Like, don't, don't cut yourself short. Um, bodybuilding is a science. You know what I mean? I think a lot of people try to make it overly complicated because of the era that we live in and all this kind of stuff, but it's really not. It's really, um, the secret of, of doing this as well as anything is just intensity of what you do. You know yeah. what I mean? It's just what you put into it, you're just going to get out of it. It's as simple as that. If you go through the motion with a bicep curl, chances are nothing's really going to happen to you. But if you have intent and intensity in the movements that you do, you're going you're gonna to make ground. You know what I'm saying? And, and, and you're going you're gonna to achieve what you want to achieve with the consistency you put into it. It's just how it works. Just great life advice. And I, I think that's a, a great point to wrap this up on. And I, this has been really, oh, this has been great. I really appreciate talking bodybuilding. Other, other than you. my phone dying, this has been great. <laughs> uh, yeah. So no, Generation I, Iron, Natty yeah. for Life is available now yeah. for everyone to uh, stream on video on demand. That, that, that's that's the best place for people to get it? Yes. Uh, yes. But now, yeah, absolutely. They can see, they can check it out there. So yeah, I, I'd love to hear feedback. You know what I mean? I love, um, you know, get comments, get messages, whatever, not I, I, you know, people can tell me I'm, I'm full of shit. I don't care what they want to say, but I, it's always cool for me, for me to hear, you know, what people say. And I love messaging people back good, bad, negative, whatever, not. So I, yeah, you know, be, be cool just to hit me up and let me know what you think. I've just been, I've just been excited to get to know you a little bit more. You know, like us, my friend, I've really fun. enjoyed. And and yeah. I, I love the questions. You know what I'm saying? It's really cool to 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 get a lot of the questions that you pumped out, man. So thank you for that. Rob Terry, ladies and gentlemen, he is an exceptionally large man. And Generation Iron Natty for Life is available now. And thank you for bearing with us during some technical glitches during this interview. About halfway through, Rob's phone started to die, so he unplugged his headphones to plug in his phone to charge it, so it sounded a little bit different there. And then his phone still ended up dying anyway for some reason. So we edited around that. You wouldn't notice that other than noticing that it went from headphones to no headphones back to headphones. But we were disconnected for like 10-ish minutes, but we edited around that. So it all looked good. And what a great conversation with him. And he's just crushing it in the world of natural bodybuilding. I mean, he is at the top of the heap. One of, if not the best natural bodybuilders in the world. Unbelievable. By the way, you guys followed my move across the country as I moved out here to California. And I've been here two weeks now. And as you can see from, <laughs> from this collection of boxes here, I think I still have one, two, three, four, five, seven boxes that I haven't unpacked yet. I've unpacked the important stuff. I'd say I'm like, 63% unpacked, but the most important stuff is, is where we do the interviews. It's, this is it. A lot of people ask what the interview setup looks like. So uh, this is it. The most important is the lighting. That is the most important thing for any interview. So we've got the Amazon, of course, right? So that, and then we've got this in the background. How, how awesome is that, right? How awesome is that? But yeah, this is it. It's uh, literally just sitting here yeah, computer, and uh, that's it. I didn't plan to do this. I just figured it was behind me, and I'd give you guys a little tour here. So as we end things, why don't we, uh, why don't we end things right there? Boom.